First up, we have got Dick Fleischman. He's the operations coordinator coordinator for the Four Forest Restoration Initiative, um, which is the biggest restoration project in the history of the Forest Service. Um, Dick has been with Forest Service since 1977, uh, and his dad before him since the 50s, um, and his dad actually graduated from USU, so some Aggie blood in him. Uh, yeah, let's welcome Dick. Please hold your applause until you hear what I have to say. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, Four Fry. I call it Four Fry because Four, Fry, Four Forest Restoration Initiative is way too many syllables. Uh, we, we bring it down pretty quickly. And f plus the Forest Service, if you don't do an acronym, you're not doing it right. So uh, here's what we're going to talk about today, a little bit overview of Four Fry, different ways to measure success. Um, that's always an issue with, with any kind of project. And some challenges and how we're actually getting to success related to those challenges. So the Four Forest Restoration Initiative was born out of fire. Um, 1996, there were some large fires in and around the Flagstaff area, and the forest and local uh, stakeholders, uh, NAU Ecological Restoration, was it even Ecological Restoration in 96? I can't remember when it started. Um, city of Flagstaff, so we gotta do something to, to uh, actually uh, curb the fire danger to, to Flagstaff. So, they formed, there was a, a partnership formed there, a collaborative Grand Canyon Forest Partnership, later morphed into the Greater Flagstaff Forest Partnership, started doing 100,000 acres of treatment around Flagstaff. 2002, uh, Rodeo Chetiskai Fire, 470,000 acres, or just under that. Um, Tano, White Mountain Apache, uh, Sitgraves National Forest. 45% uh, high severity fire, very unnatural for ponderosa pine ecosystems. Right after that, Natural Resource Working Group started looking at how can we, same issue as Flagstaff, how can we actually protect our communities in the White Mountains? This is known as the White Mountains in Arizona. Um, so the Natural Resource Working Group came into, into play. The state got involved with collaboration, formed the, the Governor's Forest Health Council in 2003, and they started looking at, at forest-related issues statewide in Arizona. In 2008, there was a Northern Arizona wood supply study that actually looked at this green blob here. How much wood is available there? What's the socially acceptable range of treatments across that to get towards some kind of, of restoration? These previous efforts were talking about fuels reduction. Restoration started coming into the, to the uh, nomenclature about 2008, 2009. 2009, Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Act passed. 2010, stakeholders and Forest Service applied to get additional Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Act funds to actually do landscape scale restoration. We are selected in 2010 as one of the first 10 projects. This is a sidebar in 2012, 13 more projects were added nationwide. Our footprint is this green blob that was defined in the, Nash, in, in the uh, uh, Northern Arizona Wood Supply Study. Our project starts below the Grand Canyon on the Kaibab National Forest goes down onto the Tucson District, Williams District, goes across the rim on the Coconino National Forest, two districts there, two districts on the Tano National Forest, four districts on the Apache Sitgraves National Forest. You talk about complexity with line officers, that's an issue, but that's, they're actually, they're actually moving the same direction here. So why are we needing to restore this? Natural range of variability for southwestern ponderosa pine, we have defined very well. We're blessed with more research than just about anywhere in the, in the world about forest restoration. Um, we're looking at natural range of variability, 25 to 125 trees per acre. Most of our stands are sitting at 400 to 1,000 stems per acre. That's, uh, the technical term for that is out of whack. <laughs> so with that Collaborative Forest Landscape for Restoration Act, we started doing treatments based on existing NEPA that we had, and then we needed to do additional NEPA. So how are we starting to measure success across this landscape? Typically, Forest Service is good at counting widgets. We count acres, we count miles completed, we need a whole bunch of things that, that we track. For the initiative, we, we track 26 different performance measures. I'm just gonna concentrate on the two biggies that we have primarily here, and that's mechanical harvesting as well as uh, prescribed fire. And our prescribed fire, we actually are doing quite a bit of wildfire for uh, meat resource objectives. Currently, goal 50,000 acres per year. We're at about 15,000 acres. 
not quite there yet. Um, prescribed fire and wildfires, about 70,000 acres a year. As a matter of fact, last year we did about 121,000 acres of fire. So pretty aggressive in the fire realm, but still haven't got the mechanical thing uh, quite worked out yet. So this is uh, basically footprint acres. This is where we have had restoration treatments that have occurred across the, across the initiative. It's not completed restoration. It's just some form of restoration treatment. So you can see, obviously, we're ramping up, definitely getting into to larger acreages. We need to be here. Last year, we were, we were pretty darn close there. It was primarily fire. So we'll just take a quick look at what this looks like in 2010. That's what we accomplished. So then we go start working through it. We start getting a few larger blocks in there, and that's where we are able to start managing more wildfires, definitely in the East Clear Creek watershed right there in the Coconino. Start getting bigger and bigger blocks to, by 2000. Uh, 15, we got the Camille fire, over 30,000 acre wildfire managed for, with resource objectives. Then we actually got the largest one we've got so far, 43,000 acres of wildfire managed for resource objectives. Doing really good with fire. The mechanical harvest, not so good. And we'll talk about some challenges related to that. So really we want to get to outcomes, you know, effectiveness monitoring. Do we do a good job of that? No, not really. How many Forest Service people in here think we do a good job of effectiveness monitoring? Sure, there's no, there's not a hand. So no, we need to be doing that. So one thing, it's been spotty across the landscape, but one thing out of the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Act is there's a requirement for multi-party monitoring. And that's actually in place, and we're looking at a whole bunch of different things. It's ecological, but it's also social and economic as well. Um, and these are questions that our stakeholders want us to answer. They want answers before we move on. And then actually this will at, at some point roll into adaptive management. But we have not got a lot of data to show you. As a matter of fact, we've got none right now. We've got a lot of pre-treatment, not a lot of post-treatment because a lot of this is tied to mechanical treatment. We have not done a lot of that yet. So how do you me measure success with NEPA? Uh, these are all completed <laughs> NEPA projects. Uh, point to this one at the very top. Uh, that orange blob, that's one EIS that we did. Site-specific NEPA, 998,000 analysis area. Came out of that, four years to do, cost about $3.60 an acre to complete. Um, cleared 430,000 acres of mechanical treatment and prescribed fire, an additional about 150,000 acres of prescribed fire. Uh, 72 spring restorations, 910 miles of road decommissioning, 39 miles of stream channel restoration. Um, that is a huge success to be able to get that through without litigation. Well, we did get one litigate, litigant that came in, but they were litigating because we weren't doing enough. That's a strange landscape to be in. It's a great landscape to be in. People understand in our landscape, we need to be doing a lot of work to get our, to get our landscapes in, in good shape. These other little gray blobs inside that, that was current NEPA that we had. You can see that donut around flag stuff that we had completed. That's what was our shelf stock that we started our projects with. So beside that was so much fun, we thought we'd do a 1.24 million acre one. That's what we're doing right now, the Rim Country uh, EIS. Whoa. Is that defined as a wardrobe failure? Um, so the, the Rim Country EIS, uh, that actually go, comes, tears off to the bottom of our, of our first EIS and actually goes across the Coconino all the way over to the Lakeside and uh, Springerville Ranger Districts on the Apache Sit Graves and actually includes the, the Payson and Pleasant Valley Districts on the Tano as well. Much more complex, and we'll talk a little bit about, more about that just shortly. So as far as NEPA and getting to landscape scale, yeah, we've... We've, done, we've been very successful, and one of the main reasons was it was collaboratively done. We couldn't have done this by ourselves. There's no way we could have done that. But a lot of NEPA, we are NEPA rich. We have currently about 600,000 acres available for mechanical treatment, almost a million acres available for fire treatment. By the time that thing signed in 2019, that'll add another 700,000 acres of mechanical, another 200, 900,000 acres of uh, prescribed fire. So we are NEPA rich. We are rare across the agency. So just talk a little bit from now on, just about challenges and successes. So 
I label this one 110 years of tradition. We heard this morning about people don't want to do things differently because they've always done it that way. That's just our, our, our culture. Uh, we, look, we have the same organization, organizational structure we had as in 1905. Line staff organization. Line make the decisions, have signature authority. That's not doesn't fit well with collaboration. So we're trying to figure out how we can actually be collaborative and work within that, that same landscape. Uh, we heard earlier, manual direction, and thank you, forest plans don't fit in well with, with uh, uh, restoration. So how do we actually roll that into it? And we are constantly battling tradition. We've always done it this way. We've always done it this way. How do we break that down? That's, gonna, that's a huge challenge. How are we getting to success? I said, during the objection resolution process for that first big EIS, our regional forester did a brilliant thing. He invited our stakeholders to the table. And when we had objectors bring up a point, he'd say, Forest Service, how did you respond to that? It's here, here, here in the document. Stakeholders, how did you guys do that collaboratively? Boy, it took the sale out of our objectors. We had actually, uh, Wild Earth Guardians actually dropped their objection after going through that objection resolution process. So that's a unique way to roll your, your uh, stakeholders into the, into the NEPA process. Uh, we need definitely change the way we're doing uh, concerning timber sale prep. We're looking at 50,000 acres of, of offerings a year. If we mark every stick of that, 22 bucks an acre, it's over a million dollars in paint alone. That's a ridiculous amount of money. So going to D by P, designation by prescription, designation by description, um, is the way that we're moving towards that. Uh, Neil Chapman from TNC is gonna talk a little bit about some of the technology that uh, they're co-developing with us to actually get to that, to where we actually have a little more control over operations and get a better end product. Look, we're looking at agreements to get work done. We can't do things the same way as we've always done. No way. Um, so we've signed, just signed an agreement with the Nature Conservancy to do, uh, uh, we just signed six supplemental project agreements. They're going to be treating 13,000 acres. Um, so they're bringing in logging capacity. That's one thing we're missing, especially on the west side of the project, lacking logging capacity on the west side of the project. Uh, so way different way of doing business as we always have it. And we're not comfortable with it. We're not very good at it, but we're learning. More work to be done. Obviously, we need to continually stretch the bounds of collaboration even though we have that line staff organization. Uh, how do we get uh, restoration mentality into the Forest Service manual and as well as forest plans? Uh, we've done forest plan revisions and we actually are pulling some new research into that. So we're, we're lucky. But I'll tell you, with that first EIS, we had two forest plans. Two were under revision in draft. When we went to final, okay, we got one signed, so we still had two forest plans, one in, one in revision, one not, one going to revision. It made it pretty complex, but we got through that. Um, so how do we tie uh, Forest Service business practice? How do we improve those? We're actually tied in with a forest modernization uh, uh, group that's actually, Forest Service is actually undergoing a modernization uh, process within the, the forest management section. And uh, we are actually tied into that. We are actually giving them information how we can be more efficient we're actually, uh, Ecological Restoration Institute is actually going to be putting on a workshop related to efficiencies and the forest modernization team will be there involved with that. So we work with our partners to actually help move this forward as well. And how do we value ecosystem services? Really, our restored acre is the valuable commodity. That's what we need to be working on, not the individual tree. So how do we get to accelerated restoration? We're at 15,000 acres of mechanical. We've been, we've gone from about nine to 15. That's not accelerated. That's not the 50,000 acres. Uh, the west side of, of, the, of the area, the Coconino and Kaibab, we said, well, we're gonna put a large 10-year contract in place to attract industry. Approximately 300,000 acres under that contract. Issued in 2012, we were thinking we're gonna be at 30,000 acres. We've cut 10,000 acres under that contract in five years. I'd say that's slightly underperforming. It's way underperforming. But there's, there's a, a rosy side to that. Actually, within the last year, new investments come into that. They put $8 million into a mill on the east side of the project. They bought a mill for the west side. 
They've actually increased logging capacity on the west side from one logging side to five logging sides within the last month. So we're trending in the right direction, but we're behind. Uh, we need to keep the industry on the east side of the project intact. Uh, when we first started this 2010, we were giving them 9,000 acres of uh, offerings a year. It's up to 15,000. If we had more NEPA, we could go as high as 20,000 over there because of their industry capacity. But we created that industry capacity with another long-term contract, the White Mountain Stewardship contract that started in 2004. And in 2014, we were paying $500 an acre there. But it created the, the industry capacity there to where we're not actually selling product to them. We're not subsidizing. Majority of our, our material is, is sold and we actually have a return back to the government. Uh, that's a different place than most places in the West. Uh, smoke and biomass, we'll get more in depth on those uh, a couple slides down. Our staffing and experience. Uh, southwestern region um, has been out of the timber business for about 30 years. Um, so we don't have a lot of expertise. I'm probably one of the few people that held on from then. So I've been in that region for 30 years and I was a sale administrator 30 years ago. Um, but we don't have a lot of that staffing. We don't have a lot, and the people we have are new. So we don't have a lot of experience. So getting them trained up and, and moving on. And we need to train them in new ways of doing business as well. So there's an advantage to that as well, is that you don't have people set in their ways. You have people that are willing to, to come in and learn. How do we get comprehensive restoration? Comprehensive restoration is what we call everything besides uh, mechanical thinning and uh, um, prescribed fire. So how do we get that, restri uh, that restoration in place and funded? Because it's always the low end of the totem pole as far as our uh, appropriated funds. So like I said, for how we get into success, we've gone from 9,000 to 15,000 acres of offerings and as everything's being bought on the east side, that's a good thing. We're looking at placement of treatments using optimization based on economics. And that's actually using a uh, process, Rocky Mountain Research, Alan Ager has, has, has uh, developed the landscape treatment design tool. Um, so we're using that to actually understand our, our, our products and mixes better. Looking at long-term stability for investors, I already talked about long-term contracts. And you heard from Spencer this morning, Northern Arizona Forest Fund. Uh, that's a way we're looking at funding some of that comprehensive restoration work. And the stakeholders have created a comprehensive implementation work group that is, we're co uh, creating five year plan for a comprehensive implementation uh, work, and then they're going out and finding funding for it. Again, understanding economics, we can do, always do better. We're constantly IDing business practice efficiencies and rolling those up, but we want to actually be use pilot authorities to be on the leading edge to actually implement those once we get those, those finalized. Uh, restoration treatments and biomass, in order to treat the entire landscape, or treat the, treat the landscape, we need to be treating in all size classes, so we're creating quite a bit of biomass. Small diameter material has no value. Uh, Forest Service manual direction is for products that are this big. When we got products that are this big, this big has grade and value, this has no grade, has no value. Uh, and again, we, ha we don't have a good understanding of business and market side. We get into success. Uh, Keep that the industry capacity in the, White, in the White Mountains. Better understanding of our economics. We're, we're, we're actually working with industry to, to find out what, our, what they need to actually be successful and try and tier that to what our restoration needs. We can't just go and say, oh, cut big old trees because that's what you need. That's not going to work. We need to be looking at how we can make a restoration-based economy. Uh, again, looking at a new long-term contract on, on, the, on the west side, and we're going, you guys are nuts. You got one that's got 10,000 acres. Why do you want another one? Well, that industry capacity is getting in place. One of the problems we've seen nationwide with large IRC contracts, sole sourcing. We know this has to be multiple contracts, multiple awards. So, so but they have actually a 10-year supply related to that. More work to be done. Where do we subsidize? Where do we not subsidize? Also cracking the biomass nut. I'm going to default to Diane Vosick. She's going to talk about that later today. So you guys be on the edge of your seat. She's going, to, she's going to rock your world on that one. And how do we value ecosystem services? Another challenge is smoke. This is actually uh, Sedona. It's a class one air shed. This is one of our managed fires. We probably didn't hit the mark on smoke there. Um, obviously public health public safety issues related to that. Actually, we had an accident on I-40 that was, that was tied to a prescribed fire we did last year. Obviously, issues with smoke. 
And we actually have conflicts between fire and mechanical thinning. Where we place a sale, we get a lightning fire, we want to manage it. Oh, we've got a contract there. That creates an issue. Um, how are we getting to success? Lots of large fires. We need to be going to bigger burn blocks. We heard that this morning. Bigger burn blocks, fewer days. Okay, the more work to be done. Actually, ironically, the more we burn, the more emissions we have. I'm going to have to get through these because we're going pretty quick on time. Um, monitoring, we just need to do a better job of it and actually turn that into adaptive management. So I'll just summarize that and go goes away. We get some questions. NEPA. One thing I want to point out here, whose science is it anyways? What's the best available science? I heard that earlier. Who has that best available science? We get uh, uh, objectors that, that push on us for that. So that's, that's the thing we have to work with. Uh, and the key thing there for us as far as how to get better of what we've learned, transparency, disclose everything. Uh, conclusions, I won't say those because you guys can read all of them. We need to get to some questions here. but. Fire doing a really good job of. Out of our 26 performance measures, we're exceeding on 18 of them. So we're not, but we're really not, we're really missing the ball on mechanical harvesting. Uh, and really the collaboration is, is the key to getting things done. And based that bottom line is our expectations always exceed our reality. We thought we could get at 30,000 acres of the contract within two years. That's crazy talk. You know, at the time we thought that was what we, it, it was gonna happen. But it's, we have to be patient with these things. They don't happen overnight, especially developing markets. With that, we'll get the question. Sorry, I went so long there. Uh, oh, we've got about eight minutes for questions. You guys are w waiting for Diane's, aren't you? Yeah. Okay, the question is, uh, a large-scale scale NEPA, are we doing that in-house or are we contracting that out? What we did was we actually created a uh, force service planning team, uh, had a planning lead, uh, NEPA specialist, uh, fire ecologist, wildlife bio biologist, a uh, silviculturist, as well as a, as a um, GIS database manager, then filled that in with, with uh, um, district participants with the project that's working on. So um, contracts, I've, they're up and down with getting performance on those. Um, you end up spending a lot of time managing those and we felt we could do it. We picked some really, really smart people on those projects. Actually, some of you guys probably know Patrick Moore. He's our silviculturist now. Uh, used to work on, on the uh, Dixie. So yeah, we did that internally. Yeah. No, uh, we've used Farm Bill CE, uh, we've used EAs, we've used EISs. So just on our large landscapes, most of ours are EAs, uh, very few EISs. We've done EISs like large landscape scale and also ones where we've, we were working on steep slopes that had some uh, uh, working with the Mexican spotted owl habitat. One thing also about that EIS is, is we are actually worked with Fish and Wildlife. We're actually actively cutting within 18 Mexican spotted owl packs and burning within 72 of them. So really good relationship with Fish and Wildlife. So that's pretty unique as well. Because it sounds like that's problematic for y'all. More questions? Yes. Yeah, every, every uh, wildfire that, that we have managed, uh, especially where it's in treatments, uh, we actually do a, uh, a fire effects uh, um, report based on, you know, looking at what that fire did. Primarily what we're, we're looking at is, is uh, one to five percent severe fire, and actually any of you did a study uh, um, that actually showed that we could actually, we should be doing more if we're looking at restoration, but we're that's not really the, the fine restoration tool that mechanical harvest is. If we can get it, that's fine. It's, it's actually reintroducing fire on the landscape. It's not the complete job. I'm not sure if there is ever a complete job because it's, di it's a dynamic system. Did that answer your question? Yeah, anyone else? No one's asking for lottery numbers or <laughs> Mike? I'm wondering, uh, in terms of the wildfire, 
it's not meeting target, it's meeting accomplishment according to performance measures. So we'll, it'll go into our FP fuels treatments, but it's not part of our target because it's not appropriated funds. So there's a difference, obviously. It sounds like that's evolving further in the, in the fire world right now. And actually, they're requiring that if we're going to report any kind of accomplishment, it has to have the, the, the fire effects uh, report with it. Stay tuned for Diane's biomass thing. <laughs> <laughs>